So what can we do with probability spaces and events? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at some different types of probability theory. And so the first is what's called classical um, probability theory. And, um, and what that says is that the classical probability theory. And that says that the probability of some event. And so this is how we're going to start talking about things is we'll put a P for the probability. That's the odds or the chances of some event. Now this isn't like a function from algebra where this falls in like a variable and you apply a formula to it. It's a label for the event. Now it might have some symbolic meaning, but it doesn't turn into a calculation. And so the prob classical probability says that we take the number of outcomes in the event and we divide it by the number of outcomes in the probability space. Or the sample space. Whichever word you want. I think the book keeps doing sample space. I think I keep calling it probability space. Um, the sample space. I will try to keep my nomenclature consistent. Um, so the number of outcomes in the number uh, in the event and the number of outcomes in the prob in the sample space. So let's make one. Let's look at it. our friend, which I will draw a lot better right now. A die. Okay, we've got one here, and we've got six over on the opposite side. We've got two here, we've got five on that side, and we'll have three here, and four up here. Okay, and so a die has six possible outcomes. Its sample space is one, two, three, four, five, and six. So the probability of rolling a one on a six-sided die, I'll use that symbol for it, one on a, D with a die with six sides, is one out of six. The probability of rolling a three on a six-sided die is also one out of six because there's only one three. So notice how the number on the face isn't part of the equation. It's an outcome, and we're talking about the number of outcomes, not the value of the outcome. Let's see, the probability of rolling even on a d6, well, there's one, two, three even numbers, so that's three out of six, or one half. And so this is a classi classical probability theory, is we count up the number of outcomes and we that are possible in the sample space, and then and we look at the event and we say, hey, you know, what's the chance chance of that event? And another there's also a way to talk about well, what's the probability of rolling a seven? on a d6. And there are no sevens, so you have a zero and six, or zero, or impossible. Now, impossible and, pro and improbable are two different things. We will find things that will be virtually impossible. The chances of them happening are very, 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 very close to zero, or mathematically zero. And then we have things that are impossible where it doesn't exist within the sample space. And um, you're going to find as we do these different types of probabilities that mathematically we get a similar result from them, but the thing they're talking about um, is slightly different. And for that, we're going to look at empirical probability next. I like how my voice sweet there. Empirical. 
And empirical is when we do something from measuring it. So empirical probability. And that's the probability of an event is equal to the frequency of the event given a number of outcomes. And this should look familiar. Now, a thing about this is that n is equal to the sum of all the frequencies. And so empirical probabilities come from observations. With a die, we look at a die and we know what the sample space is going to be. We know that if a die is fair, there's an equal chance for each side on the die. With empirical probability, we observe something, we measure it, and we say, this happens so often given this many things. So in the future, the chance of that event happening again is what this fraction is. That's why I, why I said frequency distribution is really, really important because they, they're our bridge. And so here's one of our first bridges from descriptive statistics to inferential statistics where we're, we're going to say, we observed it. That's telling us the odds that it will happen again in the future. And of course, there will be some caveats with it. Um, mathematically, um, I'll use uh, mathematically, this gives a percentage. All the probabilities give a percentage. And there are some rules that come out of those percentage. Now, I'm, I'm going, to, going to look at an example of using a frequency distribution to talk about probabilities and the mathematics of those and what the percentages look like. So let's try to get this here. I want to go to example in the textbook. It said, company is conducting a phone survey of randomly selected individuals to determine the ages of social networking site users. So far, 975 social networking site users have been surveyed. The frequency distribution shows the results. What is the probability that the next user surveyed is 23 to 35 years old. And so let's get this chart here. Take me a second to copy. 18 to 22 and 23 to do, do, do. And two screens up here. 35, 36 to 49. These are the ages they're looking at. 50 to 64. Oops, that should be 49. 50 to 64, and 65 plus. All right, and so we had a legal, and you had to be old enough to take the survey, and if you're retired, right? So, so there's some some biases in the, in the frequency distributions here, um, and there might be some biases with it being a phone survey, but we're, we're going to say that enough things were. We'll make this the frequency and this is the age. Sorry, I'm making this table really quick. And let's see how many were we, we have. We have 312 and 254. There's 312, sorry about that. 254 in the last two groupings was 195 and 98. And so what we can talk about is if we sum all of these up, so the sum of f will be the number of things in the sample. And so summing all of these up really quickly here, 156 plus 312 plus, I get 975 things. So the probability of any one of these age categories is their frequency over the total number in our samples. And so if we're looking at the probability, what probability did I want to look at here? Of them being 23 to 35, uh, 
I'm looking at the probability of them being 23 to 35. That's 312 divided by 975. And as a fraction, this isn't too bad for me to keep track of, but I think we like it as a decimal or percentage. Grab my calculator back in. You hear me clicking on my calculator keys now. Um, it's roughly 32 or 0 0.32. Or 32%, however we want to say it. And so the probability of randomly getting someone in that age group is 32%. And it, visually looking at it, we can see it has the most frequency. And so we would expect to get that randomly a, a little bit more often. All right, now I want to discuss, in the, if we follow along in the book, the last type of probability or you know, let's see so we had empirical classical probability um sorry i'm flipping through pages in the book here all of this has a thing called the law of large numbers I'll do this first. If I do any probability experiment and I view the results, like flipping a coin, I can flip a coin and I can get this. And it can be a perfectly fair coin. I haven't really actually flipped it that much to see the, the, um, the results coming out. And so what the law of large numbers says is that as your number of experiments get bigger, your empirical, what you observe, approaches the theoretical. Because for random things, it's perfectly normal to get this as a random nature, even though we know this is 50-50, and this is not showing me 50% heads, 50% tails. I do this, grab a coin and flip it, and very rarely in, um, not very rarely, but noticeably, you won't get 50-50 in a small number of throws. But when you start doing more and more and more and more and more throws, when you do, you know, 30 tosses or a thousand tosses, it approaches 50-50. And so the law of large numbers says that our empirical observations match theoretical. They'll approach the theoretical. And this is really good when we have things where we don't know what the theoretical are, but we can observe it. And so we try to observe it for large n. Um, though, I, though I do have some biology people, I want to be talking about what small n means, because I, I'm told that, that small n is something um, that we need to take into account. Um, though uh, me being an astronomer, I deal with you know the billions upon billions of stars. I'm, I'm a large n person. Um, so the types of probability the, the book talks about a third one, which is called subjective probability. And I, I'm actually subjective probability is out the door. It, it, you are living in the big data world. We have AI, artificial intelligence. Um, and we're having the machines being able to calculate immensely large ends, huge parameter spaces. They're able to do probabilities that we haven't before. And a lot of the jobs, I'm gonna switch over to camera for a second here, I apologize for that. Not, again, my favoritest thing to do, but I'm talking for a bit and, ooh, bright light. Oh, dim light. Yeah, that's what, what we get in, in Jeff World. I just want, want to talk um, and I don't want to point, point to, to this, but the thing is subjective probability, it used to be, um, and we have this in our education systems, where you spend about seven years learning something and you develop an intuitive for it. You've developed a level of expertise, you've worked with the thing often enough that you've seen enough of the sample space that you have an intuitive idea of what the outcomes are gonna be. And that, that's a form of probability. And we have many systems that trained and taught people in that idea of probability, probability spaces. Um, there's some 
particular professions that like a doctor is a statistical machine. Watch House. And in the old episodes of House, he was a doctor and he, people would present with symptoms and he would go, these symptoms say it's this. And they'd go, oh, no, it's not this. And then he'd look at the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And he spent his time trying to find parameters that changed the sample space so that he had less diseases and um, conditions to remedy. Once he knew what the problem was, you, you, you could find the remedy for it. And what doctors do is they look at the symptoms and go, these symptoms are most likely this disease. That's being replaced by nurse practitioners. More often than not, you will see a nurse practitioner who uses a database and they'll enter in your statistics, what you came in for, any tests or measurements they have, and then that compares it not from the level of experience of that one person, but from the level of experience that all the data that has been collected by that program is. And that's where we're moving. So the book talks about this intuition sense of probability, and it's valuable, but we're living in an age where it's going to be augmented with empirical probability beyond belief. In fact, fact, it's already, you know, there are jobs that when you started to go to school will not exist because they're being automated from an intellectual space, not a physical space. And a lot of that has to do with how we observe things and how we as human beings learn to do it. It's one of the reasons I'm saying learn to do this on a computer. You can do bigger spaces and you'll have a better skill set. Um, so that, that's my take on the, the book's idea of this in, in, intuition probability. Um, and it, it's well worth the discussion of where does that go, that educated guess and estimates. It's still a valid thing, but it's a thing that in the world you're living in, we're technologically moving away from it. All right, and the last thing I, I want to do for this particular video is talk about what probabilities can be. And there's something neat that happens with probabilities. And I'm going to take this from the empirical sense. If we summed up all of the frequencies, we would get n. And so all of the f over n's that we had for each frequency, if we sum up all of those, we get one. The way these fractions work, and you can go back and look at some of the columns we've done in frequency tables, and these added up back to one. But probabilities kind of work, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interchange the word percentage here, but this ratio is how much of the whole each individual probability could be, each event could be. And so, probabilities of an event are bounded. They have to be less than or equal to 1, and they have to be greater than or equal to 0. If it's 0, that's like saying there's a 0% chance. And if it's 1, that's like saying there's a 100% chance. That's a whole. And then in the, they can be anywhere in the middle. So probabilities are bounded in the value they can be. Now, geometrically, we tend to view probabilities from a geometry standpoint. What we'll say is this rectangle contains every outcome. I can kind of imagine that each little point in there is an outcome. And I could paint this. And if I were to paint it, each dot represents a particular outcome. Um, and so the area of all of this is all possible outcomes. Well, then this becomes an event. And so this is event E. 
so that's the probability of event E is within there. Well, we can talk about the things that are not event E, and we're going to call them the complement. And they get that little mark over. So event E is the probability of the things inside of the circle happening. And anything that isn't in the circle is its complement, or E prime as the complement. And a neat thing happens. If scroll down here, there we go. If the probability of event E is added to the probability of its complement, I have this and everything that's not this. Well, that gives me the whole thing, or one. And doing a little algebra with this, 1 minus the probability of the event is equal to the probability of the complement, or 1 minus the probability of the complement is equal to the probability of the event. These rules will help us manipulate probabilities. They'll help us calculate probabilities when we know the event. We can find its complement. We can find its complement. We can find the event. Sometimes it's easier to know one or the other. Plus, with blending these, we can talk about when we know certain parts of our sample space. And this lets us use our sample space fairly well. So, if we go back to our ages of people on the telephone, get that right. That last one should have been 58. I messed up here. Oh, well, I'll fix it. If we go for the, the ages on social media, if I could ask for what is the probability of a person being less than 65? Now, there's two ways I could do this. I could take the probability of each person before, and I could add them up. And I could add probability 18 to 22 plus the probability of 23 to 35 plus the probability of 36 to 49 plus the probability of, one, uh, of 50 to 64. And that would give me the probability of anyone being under 65. Or I could take the complement, and the complement's over 65. And so I could say 1 minus the probability of E less than 65 complement, complement, or 1 minus the probability of 65 plus. And that would be 1 minus 58 over 975. Sorry, I'm writing in the side here. I mean, if we were in class on the blackboard, I'd probably have erased this side for. And so this is how the complements can help us, is if we know the probability of all of this adds to 1. If I need to find a chunk of it, sometimes I might know the other chunks. And so in this case, the complement of what I'm looking for is easy to find, the 58 over 975. And so I do the 1 minus 58 over 975. You will find leaving these in fractions for a while helps you. And we'll, as we do some of the homework, um, we'll work on different ways to deal with the fractions. All right, this kind of fin finishes section one. We'll look at section two shortly.